So, Emily, thank you very much for joining us here on stage. So, Emily, the European Union is often in the headlines today, and so are you. You're in the news, you're in the headlines, because you're campaigning ardently, relentlessly, for transparency and accountability. Why is this so important in today's challenging environment? Well, I'm not sure whether I'd use the verb campaigning. I suppose I'm just doing my job. Uh, as an ombudsman, which is essentially to make sure that people are treated fairly by the administration of the European Union. Uh, and of course, transparency would be a big part of that, and it should be a routine part of good governance. But I think over the last number of years, and particularly since uh, Brexit and since the arrival of uh, <coughs> Donald Trump uh, to the presidency of the United States, I realized that it's become actually more important for the European Union institutions now because. Um, and I even I hesitate to say this because it makes it sound a little bit pious, but I think that the European Union has almost a, a moral obligation uh, to give a particular kind of leadership in the world today, which is about um, maintaining and supporting fundamental values. And therefore, I think it is even more obliged to act with integrity. Uh, and uh, in order for people to trust the message that the European Union uh, is putting out and in order for people to see that in this very chaotic and, and crisis-ridden world in a lot of areas that there, there, there is hope. Uh, Michael talked about having hope and I think that the EU should be the place where hope is really coming from, stemming from. Absolutely right, Emily, but we saw yesterday at the UN and we saw also in the message that Guterres gave that human rights are really uh, on the retreat in many parts of Europe, many parts of the world. So what does your network of ombudsmen, the European Ombudsman Network, do in areas such as human rights, rule of law, democracy? What are your priorities when you're talking to your colleagues? Well, again, I, I tend not even to talk about necessarily or put it out to, to the forefront of the work that I do. I tend not to use the expression human rights that often, possibly because, you know, even when I was, uh, when I was ombudsman in, in Ireland uh, for 10 years, I, I found that governments sort of shiver and shake a little bit when, when you talk about human rights. And I mean, I'm sure all of you have, have experienced that because they see them as a nuisance sometimes, they see them as expensive. Um, and so, as ombudsman, we deal with, the, with maladministration uh, and fundamentally we deal with, with, with fairness, with institutions and bodies and agencies treating pe people fairly. So when we manage to get, let's say, accessible housing for a person with disabilities, uh, when we manage to get you know, pension for somebody who is without that form of protection, when we uh, manage to get a social benefit for somebody, you know, we call it, you know, they've just been given their rights or they've, they, they've, been, they've been, you know, afforded a good, good administration uh, and, and all of that. But really what we are giving to them is, is their human rights. So, of course, ombudsmen deal in soft power and a lot of the work that I do with, uh, with the network of ombudsmen throughout the European Union um, is to, in a way, embolden them in relation to, to, to the power that they have. Um, I was very influenced many years ago when I was at a conference a bit like this and there were sort of various sort of um, sayings and, and, and uh, quotations being shown uh, on the screen. And one of the most powerful ones and one that resonated with me was a, a saying, a quotation that said, you begin to lose power on the first day that you don't think you have any. And I think that that is really true. I think it's true for everybody in this room. Some of you might be involved in small organizations, small institutions, you may feel relatively powerless, but actually you're only limited by the degree to which you feel powerless. As ombudsman, like most of my colleagues, nobody has to actually um, do what I ask them to do. Nobody has to accept my recommendations. So the power of the office is being able to use it in such a way that people are persuaded uh, of the merits of the arguments that you have. Um, but one of the ways I also work with the network is by combining our forces so that together we can make change. And specifically in the, in the area of fundamental rights, one of the issues that I was quite concerned about a few years ago was the way that uh, people who had been refused asylum uh, in the EU were being returned to another country, perhaps in Africa, perhaps somewhere else. Uh, and this involved um, Frontex, uh, the agency, the external border uh, agency, uh, 
And basically their role was to um, supply different states, different member states with, uh, with transport. So Frontex would bring a plane, let's say, to Madrid. Uh, Spain would say, we have some people we want to send back to, let's say, Nigeria. <clears throat> the plane would land. Um, the people would be put on the plane and they would be brought back uh, to Lagos or, or someplace like that. And I remember one day in, in Strasbourg, somebody from the um, Frontex came and showed us a video of the flight. And it, it showed it land, not, nothing terrible happened on the flight, but you could sense how difficult it was, particularly for the people who were being brought back, but also for the people who were monitoring and for the staff and so on. So anyway, it landed in Lagos and people got off and there were security people who, who um, took them in. Uh, the door was closed and the flight just left. And I said, well, what happens then? And he said, well, that's no longer our responsibility. So it, it made me think about, well, what happens? How are these particular flights monitored and how are their human rights protected? So along with about 17 of my colleagues in the member states, we all did reports on the monitoring and the human rights standards that should apply to these flights. Uh, and as a result of this, we did a, a significant piece of work which the European Commission certainly took on board and Frontex took on board. And as a result of that, um, I, I, the human rights standards are appreciably higher on those flights. So that was just a small piece of work which harnessed the power, the soft power of the network to affect significant change. But that also means that people actually have to listen to you, have to hear you and, 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 and comply with some of your concerns. Is that happening with member governments, with the European Commission? Partly, yes. But is that happening? Because the crisis, the so-called crisis of refugees and migration continues. So your challenge is to keep doing it relentlessly in a sense. Yeah, well, I can only do a small part. I was thinking about this yesterday when I was at a, another event here which was attended by um, oversight bodies, it was the ombudsman and, and auditors. And we were reflecting on how, you know, we can best do our job in, in, in time of challenges that we're facing now. <clears throat> and I said it's very simple, we just simply have to do what we are supposed to do, no more or no less. Um, and I think we can act as a support for the political system because obviously politicians in the environment in which they work are often perhaps forced or compelled or feel impelled to bend and change with the wind, particularly the populist winds that we're witnessing now. And I think the, the role of civil society and the role of institutions such as the Ombudsman is precisely to show them, I, and I know that sounds a bit patronizing and I don't mean it to be, but to enable them and to support them in the work that they do by doing our work ourselves. But if I make a recommendation, and if it isn't immediately being accepted or isn't accepted at all by an institution, you know, I will, I will take an amount of responsibility for that in that I will have carried out a forensic investigation, I will have done it independently, I will have made recommendations that I feel are valid. But after that, it's over to the institution to make its particular choices in relation um, to what we do. Because I think, the, the problem, one of the problems that's happening now is that when institutions aren't um, uh, being able to operate as effectively uh, as they should, um, then I think um, they lose confidence in their capacity to do the right thing and therefore they need to be supported by people and organizations that, that, that are here in order to sort of get, stiffen their resolve, if you like, in, in, in terms of doing what they're, what they're supposed to do. What I do worry about, however, is that because we have seen such poor behavior and such a, a lowering of standards and values, I think particularly in, this, in parts of this US administration, and even in, in relation to, to Brexit and Britain and what that says about parliamentary accountability and responsibility and all of that, that what I fear is that when faced with such poor behavior there, that the rest of us might feel that things that we might have found were constituted bad behavior a few years ago no, are no longer seen uh, to be uh, a, a challenge or, or poor simply because compared with what's happening elsewhere, it seems fine. So if I make a recommendation in relation, let's say to a revolving doors case or something that has to do with ethics and integrity, my worry is that there will no longer be the same sensibility about the harm that these cases do that there would have been a few years ago. Absolutely. So populism is contagious, stupidity is contagious, and rule of law is declining everywhere. So how are you fighting it, Emily? Because this is, as you said, it's constantly under threat. 
um, your pressure is very good. Can we do something more? Can you know what would you advise uh, our, 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 our members mm -hmm. here? What would you think? You well, said combined networks. How do we work together? Well, I think first of all we we have to name it um, and and check it and challenge it uh, at, at every at every t every time we see it because any of us who have. You know, and I know it's always dangerous to make comparisons to what is happening now and what happened in the 1930s, uh, because that can be risks uh, sort of uh, understating what happened back then and perhaps overstating what's happening now. But when you see certain things happening, when you see politicians in some countries making to what to us are outrageous statements that are xenophobic or racist or you know, whatever, uh, sexist, um, you wonder at, at what point do you, does it really need to be checked? And, and if you look at, you know, again at the history of the 1930s or at any point when something very bad has happened, it never happens overnight. It always bubbles up uh, over a long period of time. And so I think we're also, we're all constantly asking ourselves, is this, is this what we're experiencing now? And at what point do we check it? But I think, I think good things are happening. I mean, for example, um, last week or the week before in the European Parliament, you had Parliament vote for the first time recommending that the Commission um, essentially sanction Hungary in relation to um, uh, some of the things that that uh, government is doing. Uh, the Commission just uh, two days ago has taken a case to the European Court of Justice in relation to a proposed Polish law which uh, the Commission and others feel would further undermine judicial independence in Poland. So the system is fighting, the checks and balances in the system are there and they're working. And I, and I think that is, that, that is you know, a sign of hope. It makes my work easier when I know equally that there are people as committed in the political system to um, sustaining and, and promoting and protecting the fundamental values. It's a, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a slow uh, wrenching mechanism though, isn't it? We need something more permanent, don't we? Because we talk about Poland and Hungary, but in fact, in many parts of Europe, there are problems with the rule of law, with minority rights, with uh, civic society engagement, etc. It's not just those two countries, right, Emily? No, absolutely. Uh, ev every country is experiencing that. I mean, it, it's not, I suppose, those, those are the two that are in the sights of the Commission at the moment, I yeah, suppose, right. so those are the ones that are, that are, that are most obvious. But I think uh, one of the, I was just, when we were chatting just before this, I, I've made the point a few times that, you know, there are European Parliament elections coming up uh, next May. A lot of people are disengaged from those. As, as we know, the, um, the participation rates, the voting rates are famously low, and particularly amongst young people. Uh, we all know the reasons for this, but I think partly is the reality of the power of the Parliament hasn't caught up with people's consciousness of the power of the parliament because the parliament is a co-legislator with, with all of our member states and, and it, is, it is very powerful. And also when people talk about how we can get active, the simplest and most powerful active thing we can do is to vote. Um, and I've seen that in, in when, when you see what happened in Brexit, when young people in particular didn't vote, I mean, there was a very low turnout of um, young people voting in Brexit, yet for those who did vote, over 80% of them voted to remain. So in other words, the generation who is going to inherit whatever emerges when all of this is, is said and done is the generation that didn't want it to happen anyway. But curiously enough, there's always a sort of a silver lining uh, after these things. When a lot of young people saw what happened in Brexit and were appalled by it, and, and it, was, it was very wrenching emotionally for them. I mean, there were a lot of families that were literally split and remain split because of that. Children very resentful of their parents or grandparents who had, who had voted in a different way. But that actually um, ended up galvanizing a lot of them politically. And you saw that when the general election was called not that long afterwards, and a lot of them supported Corbyn, they got involved, you know, in, in, in supporting the Labour Party, who seemed to have different policies. Mind you, Mr. Corbyn, I think, is slightly anti-EU as well, so that's not necessarily going to go the way they might like it to go. But I've seen it in my own country, when the politicians have failed to tackle a particular issue, and in my country that was uh, abortion rights uh, for women. We also had a marriage equality um, uh, referendum, which, which passed by, by a significant majority. But a lot of that activism was generated at grassroots, was generated at the level here. And what has happened is that a, a generation of young people, and I think particularly women, have actually suddenly for the first time noticed their power. They really have seized their power.
And at the moment, again, I, I don't want to keep referencing my own country, but I suppose the one I'm most familiar with, there's a big housing shortage, a lot of homelessness. And again, people are now seeing, well, if the political system isn't acting fast enough, it's certainly acting, but perhaps not fast enough, we need to get in there and we need to galvanize it. And certainly the power of social media and all of that, and I know that's very much represented uh, at, at, at this forum, people have seen that they have all of these tools in which they can insert themselves positively and with fantastic results into the democratic system. So I think that, that, that's very positive. It is positive, Emily, but a lot of people and the young people especially are disaffected, disenchanted, and that's partly because they feel that the EU institutions aren't democratic enough, you know, the famous democratic deficit. So you as the ombudsman, uh, how, do you, how do you counter that argument that we need more democracy uh, accountability at the EU level? Well, I know a lot of the talk between now and May will, about, will be about trying to make people identify more with Europe. I, I don't think too many people get up in the morning and worry about how much they identify with Europe. I think most people get up and hope they have a job to go to, good education, good health care for their kids, a, you know, a, a future that is sustainable um, for their families. And in a way, they don't care who's, who is giving that to them. But if the European Union is seen not to be giving them that, then of course blame is going to be there and of course they're going to feel detached from it. And for example, after the, I came into office in, in 2013, and so it was still at the height of the financial crisis. And people in very many countries, and particularly countries like Greece and Cyprus, and indeed my own country, were, were suffering really badly. Uh, and when cutbacks happen, they don't just affect people's you know, pay packets, they actually literally affect their health. And an awful lot of people in all of those countries also committed suicide. So there were horrible outcomes, and, and that, uh, from, from the policies that were pursued. So occasionally people would come to me informally, sometimes perhaps at a gathering like this. I remember a gentleman from Cyprus and he said, look, I, I can't get, my brother is suffering from cancer, the health system has gone to hell in my country, I can't get treatment for him, what am I going to do? Or how can I make a complaint against the Troika? You always remember the famous Troika, they call it something else now, I think. Um, but of course, the Troika isn't and wasn't an EU institution because the IMF was in it as well as the European Central Bank and the Commission. So in terms of accountability, they felt powerless to make it accountable to them. Now, afterwards, of course, there's been a great deal of reflection about the way it was handled and it was a crisis and mistakes were made and all of that. But I think the, the legacy has been one of distrust because whatever about you know, the, the, the detail of the responsibility of the member state, the responsibility of the institutions. When the members of the Troika came into, literally into the, into the cities uh, and into the towns of these various countries, people saw that as the EU. Now, a lot of very positive things were done, uh, obviously, but, um, you know, most people saw that the, the downsides uh, were you know, the, the responsibility of the European Union. And in terms of young people, obviously one of the big legacies has been very high levels of youth unemployment, uh, particularly in countries like Spain, for example, and, and, and other countries. And you can hardly feel, expect um, young people in those countries to be cheerleaders for the EU if they feel that the, the lifestyle to which they had aspired is not, is not available to them. But what, what the small piece that I do is to make the institutions more accountable and more visible and more accessible. Uh, I, I know even those terminologies sound very abstract, but one very small piece I'm doing is asking the council, which is all of our ministers who go to Brussels to make the laws that impact all of us, to let us know how they vote and the positions they take on legislation when it's going through. Because at the moment, they keep their arms across it generally and we can't see. So in the way that we can, to a degree, impact on our member state legislation, it's very difficult uh, to do it unless you're an insider in the EU. So many parts of the jigsaw puzzle have to be worked at the same time, Emily. My finally, final question to you is this. You know, we've, here we're all sort of on the same wavelength. Uh, yesterday there was talk of a bubble, you know, we're all working together. The biggest challenge is to reach out to the people who disagree with us, right? And to the people who think differently. Um, as the ombudsman, is that something that is a priority for you as well, to try and convince the skeptics? Well, some people won't be convinced, um, and I know that there's a big 
you like, intellectual or academic debate about the extent to which one should invite people like Steve Bannon, for example, or people who are on the, the far right extremes to debate, uh, and whether that actually amounts to appeasement and whether that, in a sense, um, just adds to their luster, if you like, their, their attractiveness and all of that. And I know there have been tortured debates and newsrooms and at conferences like this and all of that about who to invite. But I think what you're talking about is not the, the Stephen Bannons of the world, it's, 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 it's ordinary citizens and ordinary people. Um, and, and certainly some of the work I do is to try and make that more accessible. But I think the member states themselves have a huge responsibility. The parliaments, the, the you know, European Affairs Committee, civil society and all of the member states, they can't just leave it to the institutions of the EU, they themselves have to be you know, the, the advocates for that. But above all, I think more than ever, the European institutions, so much is, they, they have a lot of power, they have a lot of influence, so much is expected of them. And I know sometimes they resent the fact that I or others are criticizing them and that they're held to a very high standard, but so they should be because this is a time of crisis and we need more than ever for those institutions to be acting at the highest levels of, of ethics and, and of integrity. Thank you very much, Emily. Thank you very much indeed for that very empowering statement. And I think the role of the European Union is crucial, but the struggle, as you've said, continues. So thank you very much indeed. Please join me in thanking Emily. Thank